Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Foot and Ankle Injuries, Malpractice and Medicine. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law since the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship, where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. Nacro will discuss legality of foot and ankle pathology, personal injury, medical malpractice, workers' compensation, expectations of the expert, significance of the diabetic foot, complex regional pain syndrome. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. Abrigita Nacra is a board-certified reconstructive foot and ankle surgeon. She is the president of the Arizona State Physicians Association and is also the medical director at Advanced Ankle and Foot, which is located in Gilbert, Arizona. Besides practicing medicine, Dr. Nacra is a published editor, instructor, lecturer, and speaker. She comes to us with extensive experience in medical legal work involving medical malpractice, personal injury, product liability, and worker compensation cases. She has worked on federal, in-state, and out-of-state cases. Attending to require passcode, the word for today is foot. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this password into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete a survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dr. Nakra, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, can everybody see the slides? I'm sorry? I'm going to, I just want to make sure, uh, Rochelle, everybody can take a look at the slides. Yes. Yes, they, they can. I'm sorry. Perfect. Excellent. Um, and I'm trying to uh, bring this live up on my screen. Perfect. Bear with me, folks, as I maneuver through this. Perfect. Well, welcome, folks. Uh, thank you for, uh, depending on which part of the country you're from, thank you for joining in during your lunch or uh, um, uh, half of the week is done, so uh, uh, towards uh, the latter part of Wednesday. Uh, for the next uh, uh, probably 45 to 50 minutes, uh, what I would like to do is share with you uh, my experience uh, as an uh, expert, as a reviewer, et cetera, uh, in um, legal cases involving foot and ankle uh, pathology. Um, as uh, Rochelle uh, introduced me, I'm a board certified uh, reconstructive foot and ankle surgeon and I'm a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Uh, and my specialty is, of course, foot and ankle medicine and surgery. Uh, what we will focus in over the next a little bit is uh, the different um, uh, legal cases uh, of, uh, that I've uh, been involved in, that I've reviewed, or uh, et cetera, uh, and they uh, encompass uh, personal injury, uh, they encompass uh, work, uh, workers' compensation, and they, uh, certainly medical malpractice. Uh, another part of uh, legal consulting that I do is product liability cases, uh, and we'll uh, briefly talk about that as we go. Uh, so uh, uh, starting with uh, personal injury, um, for all you folks, uh, the lawyers, uh, CNAs, insurance companies, adjusters out there in the audience right now, uh, the, the personal injury cases involving foot and ankle really uh, uh, involve slips, trips, and falls, so uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents and liability cases. So uh, this would include uh, uh, some of the recent cases uh, or cases in the past that I've reviewed uh, include uh, uh, fall from uh, while driving a vehicle and uh, getting uh, while they're at uh, work um, uh, and uh, getting involved in an accident. Uh, and the cases that I've reviewed, is, uh, reviewed are patients who were um, uh, pedestrians, and they were involved in the accident. Um, uh, so certainly that goes under motor vehicle accidents. 
uh, and there's various pathologies that we see in there involving the uh, uh, foot and ankle. These can range anywhere from fractures uh, to nerve injuries uh, to dislocations uh, to ankle sprains uh, to open wounds, um, etc. Uh, so these are the cases uh, that uh, I'm referring to when I'm talking about personal injury. Uh, some of the uh, other cases, interesting cases that I've seen is uh, a patient who uh, underwent a uh, pedicure uh, at a, a nail salon and ended up uh, with infection in their foot. Uh, so these are the different kinds of uh, uh, liability cases or personal injury cases involving uh, foot and ankle. In regards to malpractice, uh, uh, there are various uh, cases, uh, anything really frankly involving the foot and ankle, but the, some of the more common ones uh, that uh, we see, that we talk about, uh, include a surgical correction of a bunion deformity. Uh, as some of you are probably, most of you are aware, a bunion is that bony prominence uh, in your foot, um, which uh, leads to pain, difficulty in shoe gear, limitations of activities, et cetera. Uh, one, of the hot, uh, one of the very common uh, cases um, that routinely comes across my table is the diabetic foot. And actually, we'll go a little bit more detail later on in the presentation about the diabetic foot. So I'll um, uh, go into more details later on about this. Um, wound care, right? there's so many wound care products out there. So you're essentially utilizing wound care for open wounds, alterations that patients uh, or, or claimants uh, might have. And the etiology, the cause of these wounds can be multifactorial. It could be uh, because of diabetes. It could be because of sickle cell anemia. Um, uh, it could be uh, because of obvious trauma. It could be because of smoking. It could be because of peripheral arterial disease. Various, various medical conditions that cause open ulcerations. Uh, the reason this is very relevant in regards to what we are talking about is anytime you have an open wound, there's a much higher propensity for an infection. Uh, with subsequent complications associated with that. Uh, so it uh, behooves uh, uh, not only the patient, but the treating physician uh, to uh, uh, evaluate and uh, render prompt care. Uh, so we'll talk uh, more about this in concert with the diabetic foot, and I'll put all of that together uh, when we come to those slides, just a little bit further down in this uh, talk. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, uh, uh, we'll talk about um, uh, uh, broken uh, broken feet, uh, broken ankles, different kinds of fractures. Uh, there are well over 25 uh, bones in the foot and the ankle, so uh, various bones that can be fractured. Um, so we'll talk about uh, how uh, uh, it, what the appropriate treatment protocols for these are. Then we'll talk about infection in regards to the diabetic foot, uh, why uh, these need to be treated aggressively and promptly. Um, and uh, surgical intervention and pain. And we'll certainly talk a little bit more about CRPS, which stands for Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, uh, which was uh, in the past known as RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Uh, some of um, uh, these, um, I'll give you my uh, viewpoint uh, from a legal uh, perspective and a medical perspective. So these are some of the uh, things that we'll uh, talk about and during question and answer. I uh, certainly encourage all of you to ask me any questions that you have as we uh, proceed further through this presentation. Uh, under work comp, uh, like I said, the three primary components of medical legal work that I do are uh, the personal injury, medical malpractice, and workers' compensation. And workers' compensation uh, uh, is uh, in the state of Arizona, which is where I practice. Um, it's the same thing, uh, folks who are at work uh, falling from ladders, uh, for, uh, for, uh, slipping and falling on the curb, uh, stepping on something that goes through their shoe. Uh, these slips, trips, and falls can result in sprains and strains of the various joints and ligaments and tendons in the foot and the ankle. They can result in fracture of the foot and the ankle. Uh, so these are some of the things that are included um, in workers' compensation and the appropriate treatment protocols for it. Um, so moving right along, uh, under uh, since uh, I'm the expert and uh, I, I actually do plaintiff and uh, defendant work, uh, and uh, so uh, when as an expert, uh, we are uh, when I uh, get a case, uh, I review the case and I frankly give you a candid opinion uh, in regards to what the pros and cons of the case are, uh, and then I leave it up to um, 
uh, the specialist, which is you folks, to decide how you want to take it. Uh, so uh, how I prepare, uh, the expectations that you should have from an expert are presentation. Uh, my, speaking for myself as the expert, um, I, I should be able to articulate my viewpoint clearly uh, to, uh, uh, to you, uh, to the opposing uh, uh, attorney, uh, to the jury, et cetera, uh, to the judge, et cetera. So presentation. And presentation will come across as succinct, as will come across as concise, will come across as uh, uh, something uh, in simple terms where a non-medical person can understand my viewpoint, uh, where I'm the advocate for uh, the side that I'm representing, only happens if I'm prepared. And pre uh, preparation is an extremely important part of what we offer uh, to uh, uh, our uh, folks. Uh, uh, I take a lot of pride in reviewing my records uh, uh, in quite a fair amount of detail. Uh, the best compliment that I've uh, ever gotten from an opposing attorney is uh, I'm not used to uh, experts like yourself who are so prepared for uh, depositions. So uh, preparation is key. Uh, uh, I request you that you uh, request that you folks provide us the records and uh, this is a fair amount of communication uh, so that way uh, I have a clear appreciation of what the case involves. And responsiveness. Uh, Prompt responsiveness is extremely important uh, so all deadlines are met. Uh, and experience, uh, I've been now doing this for approximately 20 years. Uh, I'm board certified. Uh, um, I've uh, published a textbook. Uh, we are, um, uh, I lecture, uh, I teach um, uh, residents, students, uh, uh, practicing physicians and surgeons all over the country, all over the world. Uh, so come with a fair amount, not, of, not just of didactic, what's published in the textbook, but also of the real world. Uh, uh, being a physician myself, being a surgeon myself, uh, the challenges that, that I face when I treat these patients so I can um, uh, humbly uh, appreciate both sides of the perspective and hopefully offer a, um, uh, a, a rational, a reasonable opinion on these cases. Uh, so uh, it really, to me, uh, the key is offering a, um, a candid, uh, well-thought-out uh, opinion uh, as an expert uh, that's based on published evidence, that's based on uh, uh, my own personal experience, and that's based on standard of care. Uh, so these, uh, these are all the thought processes. Uh, this is uh, uh, really a process that goes into coming up with a plan that I like to articulate uh, to either the law firm, the, um, the adjuster, the insurance company, et cetera. Uh, be it whether I'm on the plaintiff side or the defendant side. So what do we do as an organization? We really like to uh, believe that we offer all services in the medical legal um, community um, in regards to chart reviews uh, for all the out-of-state uh, uh, referrals that come in. Uh, we certainly do IMEs uh, in Arizona for our work comp uh, requests and for, um, personal injury, a fair amount of experience in depositions and trial testimonies. Uh, in state, out of state, and um, at the federal level. Uh, so uh, hopefully over, the, uh, over these years with a fair amount of gray hair on my head uh, and a lot of wrinkles on my face uh, um, and of course just scars of having done this for a long time, uh, I think uh, we hopefully bring a um, well thought out uh, uh, plan uh, to uh, all of you uh, to give you an opinion of what we think of uh, these cases. So before we go on to um, uh, some uh, uh, two particular cases that uh, seem to make it to my table more often than not, and certainly uh, going through some clinical scenarios and tying everything together. I just want to open up the floor to some uh, questions that you might have, uh, anybody in the audience, before we take it to the, uh, the next part of this presentation. Rochelle, the floor is yours. Hi, Dr. Macro. Um, we were still actually on slide eight, so a lot of the uh, um, attendees did not see the slides that you were speaking about. Okay. Okay. Um, Can you see them now? No, you you have to control the slides. Okay. How, can but it's okay. We can um, we can do uh, some questions now. Okay. Um, if all the attendees can enter in the passcode for, for today, the passcode is FOOT. And first question, do you prefer to receive cases in electronic or paper format? Uh, sure, Michelle. Um, 
our preference is actually whatever is easier for you folks. Uh, we are uh, technologically uh, quite up to date. So uh, depending on the enormity of the wreckage, if your preference is to put them in a Dropbox and send it to us, that's not a problem at all. If you much rather send it to us in a flash drive, you just send us a flash drive. Uh, we'll uh, uh, do it on our end and or a paper chart. Uh, what is easier for you folks? We have an internal process in place that we utilize. Uh, so whatever is easier for you folks, we can make that work. Do you handle product liability cases regarding surgical products or devices that are involved in foot and ankle surgery? Uh, yes, we do, and I think I might have briefly mentioned that at the start. Uh, yes, there, uh, as you're aware, um, uh, there's so many um, in foot and ankle surgery, so uh, um, focusing on my area of specialty, uh, there's so many different kinds of bone grafts, uh, plates, screws, et cetera. Um, and um, uh, so we do product liability cases where if there's a rep uh, reports of multiple failures, et cetera, where then we review uh, the, uh, uh, go and review all the white papers, et cetera, uh, and uh, tell them what potentially could have happened in the manufacturing, et cetera, and why this implant, for example, uh, failed on multiple locations. So yes, we do work with uh, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, companies uh, who are making these products and give, us, give them feedback uh, regarding uh, what things they should be mindful of in regards to foot and ankle products, taking into account the biomechanics uh, of the foot and the ankle, taking into account um, uh, physiology, anatomy, et cetera. So yes, we do offer that uh, uh, service also. Are you familiar with impairment guidelines and calculations? Yes, we are. So uh, uh, impairment guidelines are very common. Like for most of you um, in the audience who are probably aware of this, um, uh, it's uh, impairment guidelines. Are co impairment guidelines are commonly utilized when I'm doing. Uh, uh, be it personal injury or um, uh, work comp cases. So uh, we stay up to date with that. The AMA guidelines, uh, uh, sixth edition is what we use, uh, uh, and we calculate the impairment and the supportive care award, uh, et cetera. So uh, uh, we are able to uh, uh, provide those services also when we are either doing chart reviews or uh, doing face-to-face uh, -face IMEs, et cetera. So yes, we are able to offer that in addition to the uh, ODG guidelines, et cetera. So we keep up with all of that and um, uh, can provide you input in uh, regards to these uh, things. Next question. With a fractured calcaneus, how often is a subtalar orthodesis necessary? And what does that do Excellent. for the function? Excellent. Um, well, let's, uh, I do have some clinical cases, but I think let's talk about this because I don't have this clinical case, so this is a very good question. I actually was just recently, uh, I was invited uh, to a national work uh, lecture uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, and this was uh, one of my uh, cases that I presented was fall from height. That's common, something um, I, uh, I see um, uh, more often uh, in work comp cases, a fall from height can result in a calcaneal fracture. A cal the calcaneus uh, is the medical term for the heel bone, uh, and a fall from, uh, from a height uh, can lead to a joint depression or a compression fracture of the calcaneus. Uh, so a little anatomy 101 for all of you. Uh, calcaneus is, so if all of you are standing, that heel bone is the calcaneus. So in a calcaneal fracture, depending on the severity of the fracture, it more often than not will involve the joint. And the joint that's involved is known as the subtalar joint. Hence, there is an associated concern of what's known as post-traumatic arthritis of the subtalar joint because the calcaneal fracture commonly involves the subtalar joint. So depending on the severity of the fracture, we worry about post-traumatic arthritis. In the event that the post-traumatic arthritis is symptomatic for the patient or the claimant, then the recommended treatment at that time, depending on how severe, varies from either fusing the joint where you essentially put screws across the joint and take away that motion. Because it's that micro motion in the joint that is arthritic, which has lost its cartilage that causes pain. So by fusing the joint, you take that micro motion away 
uh, and helps alleviate uh, uh, the discomfort uh, uh, that the claimant or the patient complains about. But by fusing the joint, certainly it comes, uh, it comes with its own uh, consequences that you're taking away motion in the joints so the surrounding joints have to compensate and then are utilized much more. So yes, uh, uh, joint fusion uh, is a surgical procedure that would be recommended for post-traumatic arthritis of the subtalar joint after a calcaneal fracture, uh, depending on how severe, A, that calcaneal fracture was, B, the quality of the repair that was done. Uh, number three, all the associated injuries associated with the calcaneal fracture, uh, et cetera. So all these factors go into deciding uh, if the patient or the claimant or the defendant or the plaintiff would be an appropriate candidate for uh, subsequent surgeries to manage the sequela of a calcaneal fracture. Thanks so much. You can continue with the presentation. Excellent, thank you. And Rochelle, thank please you. let me know uh, if I'm, uh, so that I can make sure everybody can see those slides. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'll, let's, I'll let you. Uh, perfect, yeah, Rochelle, feel free to uh, um, interrupt me. I get interrupted all day in the office, so no worries at all. Um, That's fine, I just thank want to make you. Sure that these, these attendees get everything uh, that they've given up an hour of their schedule, so I want to make sure that they get everything that they would like. So, um, case presentation. So, uh, once again, um, since uh, some of, uh, most of you folks could not see the presentation, uh, the previous slides, we're going to uh, primarily focus on med mal, uh, personal injury, and workers' compensation. And there's a fair amount of overlap uh, in these cases. Uh, all our cases, as I previously stated, um, involve foot and the ankle. Uh, and, uh, med mal involves essentially be it uh, that the appropriate care wasn't rendered or more aggressive care was rendered. Uh, uh, being a physician myself, I battle with this day in, day out. Uh, uh, we as physicians always worry because just because the patient didn't like the color of my hair, I don't, uh, these things become an issue. So I think the key thing that I always tell my residents and my students is, I think patient communication is extremely important, uh, and I'm as guilty of it uh, as anybody else. Uh, sometimes we are rushed. Uh, uh, sometimes there's so many other things going on. Uh, uh, but I think at the bottom, uh, at the end of the day, um, if we can all uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, communicate with our patients, sit down and answer their questions, then I think that goes a long way. Uh, and frankly, these are all uh, um, the viewpoints uh, that I've learned uh, as I've uh, gone through my own uh, personal growth uh, as a physician and a surgeon. Uh, we'll talk about personal injury and workers' compensation. Like I said, a uh, fair amount of overlap, the injuries that are involved, personal injury, workers' compensation, more overlap. The, uh, the example that was uh, the case that was just, I was just asked, calcaneal fracture, uh, that's, uh, I routinely see that in work comp cases uh, in regards to fall from heights, uh, etc. Uh, so let's uh, start with some of these uh, cases. As I previously stated, one of the most important things uh, that I see um, in uh, in regards to uh, uh, requests for an opinion of either from a uh, insurance company, from a lawyer, uh, be it med mal um, uh, or um, a work comp case that's not healing up, and because there's underlying diabetes, etc. And the reason diabetes gets so much attention um, is just because the consequences truly can be drastic. The consequences truly can be as severe as death. So I'm just going to take you through this uh, process. How a very simple, uh, uh, how a very uh, simple cut or a wound on a diabetic can is so consequential. Uh, has some uh, such severe consequences. So for all the patients, so any approximately one out of four patients. Uh, of diabetics that I see in a day will end up with DFU stands for diabetic foot ulcer. So that's a pretty high percentage that we worry about. Um, so, uh, and the reason that's important is that we want to get these ulcers healed. That's the reason so much emphasis is placed on healing of the diabetic ulcer, management of the diabetic ulcer. Once again, DFU stands for diabetic foot ulcer. It's just because not only on because of the personal consequences on the patient, consequences on the employer because the patient or their employees out of work or that uh, ankle fracture is not healing because they have diabetes or that that uh, diabetic ulcer is getting infected. All these reasons, uh, these reasons, uh, diabetes, the uh, diabetes gets so much attention. 
in the media, in medical offices, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the corporations is that 50% of these diabetic foot ulcers will get infected. So one out of every two ulcers that I see, these are published statistics that I'm sharing with you, one out of two of these diabetic ulcers will get infected. So this is a pyramid, and think of the pyramid upside down or think of the domino effect, that things will just continue to go downhill very rapidly in a diabetic patient if they are not very aggressively treated. Uh, just recently, I was the expert in a case uh, um, uh, on the East Coast, uh, which involved a, a diabetic uh, uh, foot ulcer that unfortunately uh, just wasn't treated as aggressively as we would have hoped uh, with a, a subsequent patient ending up with a, a below knee amputation. And it all started with a diabetic foot ulcer that persisted, and that diabetic foot ulcer ended up getting infected. And uh, if the diabetic foot ulcer gets infected, and DFI stands for diabetic foot infection. So uh, 15 to 25% of diabetic patients will end up with an ulcer. 50% of these ulcers will get infected. And out of these ulcers uh, that get infected and end up with a diabetic foot infection, anywhere from a fourth to uh, uh, a, uh, anywhere from 20 to 60% of these infections will un end up with OM stands for osteomyelitis or infection of the bone. So hopefully as I continue to build this pyramid, uh, I, uh, I, I want you to appreciate how we're just going down a very slippery slope. We've gone from uh, an open wound, uh, which is an ulcer, to an infection. Uh, we've gone from a skin infection to an underlying bone infection, which is what osteomyelitis is. And this is the most important point. Diabetic foot ulcers are precursors to 85% of leg amputations. So just imagine the immense amount of mortality associated with this, uh, a wound on the foot and the ankle, which diabetics are predisposed to, could end up with the leg amputation. And that's the reason this is, uh, in the medical legal work, be it personal injury, be it med mal, be it workers' compensation, uh, there's a fair amount of emphasis uh, and legality associated with diabetes just because uh, of the consequences associated with this. And uh, there's a 50% incidence of contralateral amputation within two to five years. And the reason that happens is because of the increased cardiac load, the increased stress placed on the heart and the remaining organs in the rest of the body because of an amputation that happens, and hence the much higher 50% uh, incidence of contralateral amputation within two to five years. So hopefully all of you can appreciate why I'm spending so much time on this slide. Uh, and as we continue to build uh, on this uh, uh, pyramid, there's a three, uh, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, the three to five year survival rate after amputation is 50% and 40% with the cardiovascular uh, disease being the major cause of death. So once again, you start with a, a patient who's got diabetes, they end up with a wound because they had a broken ankle or they sprained their ankle or uh, the surgeon did surgery on the um, ulcer. These uh, diabetic patients have a much higher uh, propensity for uh, these uh, developing diabetic foot ulcers. These ulcers uh, could, can get infected. This uh, skin infection can lead to a bone infection. Bone infection can lead to an amputation. If you have an amputation on one side, 50% incidence of amputation on the other side. Once you've had an amputation, the increased mortality uh, because of the increased load placed on the rest of the organs, primarily cardiovascular, primarily your heart. Uh, so this is truly is uh, a very consequential. Um, uh, and hence, uh, there's a lot of things when I'm reviewing these cases uh, where I'm uh, looking at various things. So when we are reviewing these cases, what I'm essentially looking for is what the diff how was this appropriately managed um, by um, uh, these, um, uh, the treating physicians? Uh, were the appropriate consults uh, taken into account? Um, and I apologize, folks, it's not, uh, Rochelle, it's not letting me advance the slide. It's bouncing. Should I be doing something else? Um, no, you can just advance them uh, once you're done with each slide. Okay. Perfect. Let's just go to this. Perfect. I think we spent enough time on that. So 
so that's what I call this navigating the diabetic, but also why is it so important? Because you want to, the ulcer is a precursor to an infection. Cellulitis refers to the soft tissue infection. Osteomyelitis refers to the bone infection. Uh, the, um, the key is to heal that ulcer up as soon as possible. Because the longer that ulcer persists, as I showed you in that previous slide, the longer that ulcer persists, it's going to get infected. If it gets infected, you have to worry about a bone infection. Once you get a bone infection, you have to worry about amputation. So you want to get this ulcer healed as, uh, as quickly as possible. So in the event you are going to have some loss of tissue, you want to minimize that loss of tissue. So your level of amputation should be as distal as possible so that the load that's placed on these on the remaining body organs is as minimal as possible. So uh, I, I just want to I, I, I want to make that point that this uh, this what this clinical picture that I'm showing to you is a trans metatarsal amputation, um, uh, and so we want to we want to make sure uh, that um, that we're minimizing the level of amputation. And when I'm reviewing these cases, uh, the things that I look for is the consults that were done. Uh, uh, the, uh, the vascular consult was uh, were appropriate specialists consulted. Diabetes is a multi, is a multi specialty uh, disease process. Um, so you really want to make sure that all the associated uh, organs or systems in the body that are involved are appropriately uh, navigated through. So you want to make sure that their blood supply is checked. Uh, do they have what's known as diabetic neuropathy, where their nerves are uh, uh, potentially damaged? Um, it, do they have what's known as a Charcot foot, um, which is the joints in the uh, body are, uh, have a collapse leading to bony prominence? All these things have to be looked at. Were x-rays done? If the patient was taken to surgery, were appropriate cultures done? Were appropriate protocols followed for doing cultures? Were uh, the appropriate antibiotics uh, placed? Uh, was the patient placed on appropriate antibiotics? was appropriate blood work done on these patients. That's the reason these cases are quite comprehensive uh, and involve a fair amount of time. And myself as an expert, uh, by keeping up by, uh, with all the evidence that's published out there, I can offer you an opinion that if all the appropriate standard of care, if the, all the appropriate evidence-based medicine, of all those protocols were followed in treating the diabetic foot ulcer, there are published guidelines by American Diabetes Association regarding patients who should be tested for what's known as vascular disease because diabetic patients uh, have compromised blood supply to their legs. So if you don't have enough blood supply coming down to the leg and the patient has a wound, that ulcer will, uh, will take a much longer time to heal. And based on our previous conversation, we know that the longer time an ulcer takes to heal, the greater likelihood it will get infected. Um, so we want to make sure that an appropriate vascular co uh, consult was done or appropriate vascular evaluation or workup was done. And talking about vascular evaluation, uh, uh, we want to make sure that the appropriate tests were ordered. And this is something I constantly, um, uh, uh, constantly spend a fair amount of time teaching my residents that when uh, you have to know, not only do you should you be ordering these tests, but you have to know the pros and cons of each uh, one of these uh, um, uh, with each one of these uh, tests. So, uh, uh, in a, uh, a diabetic foot ulcer, uh, you are testing for what's known as the macro versus the uh, micro. Uh, until today, I'm baffled by how little um, we as physicians, uh, who are at the front line for treating the diabetic foot ulcer, um, know so little about this. So, when I'm teaching my residents, my students. Uh, uh, and lecturing all over, that's one point I always make about is the vascular workup that you have to do. So know which test to order, know the limitations of each one of this test, the tests that you're ordering, and uh, certainly appreciate the pros and the cons and what the test doesn't know. So you should be, if you should know that if this test gives me, uh, for example, what's known as ankle brachial indices that tells me the amount of blood supply and the amount of compromise, know what the limitations of each one of these uh, tests is. Um, uh, the, regarding some of the diagnostic tests um, that we order, MRI, CTs, bone scans, uh, and uh, uh, this might be a good time for us to talk a little bit about this. A bone scan is one of the very commonly overutilized tests in uh, 
uh, in medicine. Uh, so, for example, after I'm done with this talk, I get up and I start seeing patients and I bang my ankle uh, against the uh, door uh, to a certain likelihood that bone scan uh, will show up what's known as positive. Uh, and routinely, you'll get consults from the hospital saying bone scan is positive, so the patient has underlying bone infection. Uh, and that's just not true. So once again, knowing which test to order, I as a specialist have to be able to read my MRIs, bone scans, um, CT scans, x-rays. Uh, I do not rely on the radiologist. So anytime I'm rendering an opinion in my office as the treating physician, or I am an expert in either a personal injury, med mal, work comp case, I, one of the things that I say is just not negotiable with me being the expert is I want to look at the CDs of the tests that were done. I want to look at those MRI films myself. I want to look at the images. I read it myself. Uh, to give you an example, I recently reviewed a case in which the patient had, and I think I just shared this with you, the patient underwent a pedicure at a local nail salon, ended up with a wound on the bottom of their foot, ended up in the hospital did an MRI. MRI got read as osteomyelitis, bone infection, and I'm left scratching my head. This just doesn't make sense. So, so to a certain extent, I'm playing Nancy Drew. I used to love reading Nancy Drew in my younger days. So I'm, my goal is to get my job and my goal is to gather as much information as is possible and then reviewing it uh, with my strong uh, fundamentals and knowledge base and offering that opinion. So I would, I would strongly recommend uh, that please get me the CDs of all the studies that were done and I will review them myself. So in this particular case, I, ha I had a hard time believing that that ulcer progressed to um, infection in the bone and the patient ended up with an amputation. So I requested the MRI film and I strongly disagreed with the, uh, the read done by the radiologist. And I said, this is not osteomyelitis. The patient does have uh, bony uh, pathology, but it's not osteomyelitis. So the patient did not have a, a bone infection. The patient should not have had an amputation. And now the patient is walking with no foot at the end of their leg. So you can understand why, for me as an expert, this is just not negotiable. I absolutely want to look at the studies and give you an opinion. So not only does it help me give you an opinion, but it also lets me, uh, helps me determine any, any pre-existing issues, which becomes quite relevant uh, in uh, uh, work comp cases, for example, or in personal injury cases, and to a great extent also in uh, med mal. So when I'm looking at x-rays and the uh, patient tells me that uh, I never had any issues with my foot and ankle prior to this ankle sprain, uh, and when I look at that x-ray and I see fair amount of arthritis in that foot and ankle. Well, that's something I will uh, put in my note and I will discuss with you uh, with the opposing side, be it the, uh, or whoever's requested uh, this opinion, be it the nurse case manager, adjuster, insurance company, lawyer, et cetera, and tell you, a patient may may not have had an injury, but I can tell you all these issues, uh, the, uh, the claimant or the patient has symptom pre-existing issues uh, and help, and then we take it from there and uh, determine if there are uh, how what role these pre-existing issues are playing, and I take that into account uh, while uh, um, uh, while offering an opinion and giving an overall view. So the key is, uh, even though the slide says navigating the diabetic foot ulcer, it's navigating the foot and ankle pathology. You want to take a look at the overall picture, uh, take all that information that's out there, and then I paint a picture and present it to you uh, in non-medical terms so you can take it uh, to, uh, so that you can essentially do what you folks have to do from a legal or case management occupational st uh, viewpoint. And so that diagnostic studies to me is a very key part all the tests that are out there, I would like to review them myself so uh, I can attest to the accuracy of these tests. We have this protocol in the office. My practice is primarily second opinion and third opinions, um, where when I'm doing this, uh, I will, uh, before I offer an opinion and come up with a game plan for the patient, um, I will look at these films. And if those are not available, I'll order new ones so I can actually look at the films. I will it's um, uh, depending on uh, the circumstances, um, uh, they offer my opinion based on what's uh, already been done and but certainly order more uh, tests uh, 
uh, so that I have the ability uh, to review those films myself and come up with a game plan uh, for these patients or in these cases. Uh, moving right along, let's commonly talk about uh, a very commonly utilized uh, uh, surgery uh, that uh, we do in my profession, which is bunions. Uh, bunions is that uh, um, uh, uh, bunions is the uh, uh, the bony prominence that you see uh, in your feet. So, if all of you who are sitting down at your desk look down on your feet. So, you have the big toe, which is in the uh, towards uh, in the center. You have the two big toes, and as you work your way outward, you go to the fifth toe. So, the bunion involves that big toe. Um, so, uh, uh, a fair amount of complications associated with this. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm not at all saying that every bunion has a complication, but uh, um, uh, when these things go bad, just like in any surgery, any specialty does, when things go bad, unfortunately, it seems like the floodgates open. Uh, so, common bunionectomy risks that uh, we certainly educate our patients about. I'm certainly not at all uh, um, standing here, or sitting here, saying that. Uh, uh, all bunions end up with complications. No, all surgeries end up with, uh, all surgeries have associated uh, risk factors. And we certainly, as, physici as a physician, as a surgeon, I try to educate my patients and determine who's an appropriate candidate. So in the event that these complications do happen, which can truly happen in the best of hands, um, I, I can uh, sincerely say these complications have happened to me. Uh, but I think uh, the key is educating our patients, uh, uh, and when these complications happen, determining why these complications happen, uh, uh, providing the appropriate treatment, and certainly referring them out if you feel this is outside your area of expertise. But some of the complications that we see in uh, when we're doing these uh, uh, bunion surgeries that you can get a recurrence of the deformity where the bunion comes back, and there could be uh, multiple reasons for it, and that's what my job, either as the expert or as the treating physician, is. You can overcorrect the deformity, and if you overcorrect the deformity, you end up with a worse deformity than a hallux valgus, which is what a bunion deformity is. You can end up with that slide, that clinical that you're seeing, which is the toe uh, goes in the opposite direction. Uh, so, uh, so these patients, of course, are then uh, predisposed to that same phenomena of post-traumatic arthritis we spoke about. Or, or, are pre, uh, or they complain of that they have difficulty walking, they're constantly falling, they have pain in the joint, they have difficulty wearing shoes. So various risks associated with bunionectomy surgery. As with any bone surgery we do, uh, another associated risk is that the, that the bone might not heal up uh, in the right position. That's known as malunion, or it takes too much time to heal up, and that's known as a delayed union, or it just doesn't heal up, and that's known as non-union. And there are various reasons behind it. Uh, it can be anywhere uh, from a technical uh, compromise to uh, pre-existing issues to patient non-compliance to, frankly, sometimes just bad things happen. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, uh, my job as an expert, my job as a treating physician uh, is to um, uh, make that determination, why is this happening and what the appropriate treatment is. Uh, other p potential risks associated with uh, bunion surgery that uh, leads folks to uh, uh, knocking on doors of uh, all the lawyers that are out there is that they feel that they've lost motion or they have pain in that joint and because of the arthritis that has developed uh, be it in the joint or the surrounding bones, uh, or because uh, for various reasons uh, you end up with what's known as avascular necrosis, that that bone just dies. So all these issues that are addressed in front of you, uh, such as avascular necrosis, such as other associated deformities that develop, or the big toe shortens up, or it's, it becomes floppy where the patient doesn't have control over the big toe, or they start getting pain under the big toe joint, and that's known as metatarsalgia that's listed up in front of you, uh, or a metatarsalgia or pain in the ball of the foot. So all these are potential complications associated with bunion surgery, which can lead to unhappy patients, uh, and a various, and there could be for multiple reasons, and that's the reason uh, uh, it, uh, for me as a treating physician, uh, I try my best uh, um, to educate our patients uh, as an expert when I review the chart. That's the opinion I give to you why these things happened. Uh, if there was truly any malpractice involved or, or um, was, was this a patient issue or frankly, this is just something that, that an unfortunate incident happened. Uh, 
Um, so the reasons for uh, uh, most common uh, things that I see, uh, and this applies not just to bunion surgery, this applies to uh, pretty much all kinds of surgical procedures that we do in foot and ankle, that the reasons for recurrence when patients go, well, uh, you uh, fixed my broken ankle and I feel I'm just not walking properly now, or you fixed my bunion, or you fixed my flat foot, or you fixed my ankle ligaments, uh, et cetera. Why, why, do I, why do I feel my deformity is back? Or why do I feel, why do I feel that I have persistent or near issues? And uh, um, uh, the, issue, the things that I look for is, was the selection, uh, the procedure choice, was that appropriate to begin with? Was there inadequate execution? Could I, could I, I, and I clearly say this, I have my share of complications. I'm certainly not standing here and lecturing to anybody that, um, uh, that I have no complications. I have my share. So, uh, but uh, certainly the key is you have to be critical of the work that you yourself do. And that's the reason uh, uh, I, I stand here, sit here, uh, give this talk because uh, I've uh, critically looked at my own results and made appropriate changes over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, that was there, could I have been more aggressive uh, uh, in my procedure? Or should I, should I have been more aggressive in my procedure? Did the patient play a role in this? Uh, was the patient non-compliant? They, they walked on something when I told them, please don't walk on it. Uh, they got the foot and the ankle wet. They didn't take their antibiotics. Uh, they didn't get the blood work done. So what role did patient non-compliance play uh, in an unhappy patient? Uh, did I drop the ball on something? Did the treating physician fail to recognize something? Uh, did the patient not disclose all the issues? So once again, it's kind of a boils down to utilizing your uh, expertise. Uh, for, for us as physician surgeons, utilizing our expertise, keeping up with all the literature out there, um, uh, going to conferences, lecturing at conferences, critically looking at your own results, uh, publishing, et cetera, all this plays a big role because that widens your armamentarium that I rely on uh, when I'm offering an opinion either as an expert or as a treating physician. Uh, the, the last uh, entity that I would like to talk about uh, is uh, complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, and I'm, uh, till today, I, I, uh, I'm actually working on a case right now. Until today, I'm just, I scratch my head because uh, either this is completely missed or it's, uh, the garb it's uh, a commonly utilized diagnosis and nobody can figure out what's going on. Uh, and there's some very strict criteria that I follow uh, and this really has to be treated quite aggressively. Um, and uh, so to go through the slide, um, the most common etiology for complex regional pain syndrome, which previously was known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, is nerve injury from fractures and sprains. Uh, so, uh, and 50% of CRPS, complex regional pain uh, syndrome, is secondary to a very simple injury that unfortunately just doesn't get the respect it deserves, which is ankle sprains. Uh, so uh, I, have, uh, I, I have horribly weak ankles, um, and hence my specialty is put in the ankle. Uh, so uh, I sprained my ankles so many times, and, uh, uh, but uh, this is something that's commonly missed, is an ankle sprain is just doesn't get the respect it deserves. Uh, ankle sprains can come, uh, can have a, there's a, a percentage that does involve uh, some nerve injury. You have to be very mindful of how we treat these patients because a simple, sometimes a simple diagnosis as an ankle sprain, which should be treated aggressively, can end up in complex regional pain syndrome. And, you know, in today's day and age of Google, where I can't tell you how many times a patient walks into my office and go, well, I Googled this, and then my response is, well, what did Dr. Google tell you? Um, uh, so I encourage patients taking a role in their care, but sometimes my biggest competition is Dr. Google. Uh, and if you Google complex regional pain syndrome, it's uh, what you read on the internet is really uh, as bad as a cancer diagnosis. Uh, so these things, you, we have to be able to recognize these things and treat them very aggressively. Other things uh, in my own practice, uh, in foot and the ankles, and one of the more common etiologies uh, besides uh, fractures and sprains that I see as an etiology for complex regional pain syndrome is crush injury. So that fall from the height, uh, which led to that heel fracture, is a crush injury. Uh, or when the um, uh, case that I reviewed, uh, a patient uh, was, uh, was a pedestrian, uh, didn't stop, uh, and a, a truck ran over the top of their foot. Uh, so that's a crush injury. Uh, that would, uh, that, so those are things I look for. Uh, I would look for is, is there potential complex regional pain syndrome here? Surgery. 
things that uh, folks like myself do, surgeons in the audience who might do surgery, can potentially lead to complex regional pain syndrome. So my consent talks about that. Um, and uh, the last slide, the last notation, 10 to 25 percent is a non-traumatic origin. But I can't explain to the lawyer, to the nurse case manager, to the insurance, uh, to the patient why they developed complex regional pain syndrome. Our nervous system truly is like that motherboard and all our computers that we're watching this presentation on. Uh, it is, uh, you sometimes can't explain, and that's the reason I sometimes do find myself saying this to the patient that medicine is as much an art as it's a science. Sometimes in a year, I can't explain to you what happened, uh, and that's, that's the opinion I will render, uh, that this is what's happened, and this is how it should be treated. This is how it should be managed. So uh, certainly always on the lookout for complex regional pain syndrome because this takes an Im significant uh, emotional toll on the patient and the family with significant consequences associated uh, with it. So in a, a typical uh, uh, allegations that I uh, see in cases that go on to uh, uh, legal cases is, um, as we, uh, uh, this is my last slide, and then I want to make sure that we have enough time to answer any questions, uh, which is delay in diagnosis. If uh, and if you if uh, when I'm reviewing case, uh, that's something I commonly look for. Whatever kind of a case uh, I'm doing, was there a delay in diagnosis? Should that infection have been picked up sooner than later? Was that phone call returned in time? How soon after the surgery did the uh, surgeon see the patient in the office? Was the patient taking too many pain medications? Was the cast too tight? All these things are helping when I put on that Nancy Drew hat and that cape and I'm trying to determine, looking for clues, that's what I'm looking for. Um, was there a failure uh, to refer this patient out to the appropriate specialist? So going back to that diabetic uh, uh, example that we use, that when I'm seeing a patient with diabetic ulcer, there has to be a vascular evaluation because of the high incidence of vascular disease. When I see a patient with that calcaneal fracture uh, that one of the attendees brought up uh, and the patient after surgery continues to co uh, complain of pain, uh, should I be worried about underlying compartment syndrome that was missed earlier on because of the incidence of compartment syndrome with, uh, uh, with uh, calcaneal fracture? Was subluxing perineal tendons missed at the initial time of diagnosis of calcaneal fracture? So having this breadth of knowledge which has come by keeping up with medical literature, by publishing, by lecturing, et cetera, I, I, I know the things that I have to look for so I know what are the things uh, which I feel comfortable treating and if, that's, if it's outside my area of specialty, when should I be referring these patients out? So I am so um, I minimize the risk of failure to make a diagnosis because if we haven't made a diagnosis, uh, we won't offer the appropriate treatment uh, and there won't be appropriate referrals made. So on that note, I'll come to a stop because I want to make sure everybody gets adequate time uh, to ask any questions they have. Rochelle, the floor is yours. Thanks, Doctor. Um, if all the attendees can enter the passcode for today, which the passcode is foot. Our first question is the standard of care for uh, continual fracture weight or non-weight bearing and for what length of time? Well, um, it's a, that's a difficult question to answer without knowing more details, but I'll try to do uh, do the best so that you have a fair amount of, so I can give you some parameters that you can deal with. Um, if the calcaneal fracture was surgically treated, yes, uh, the patient should be made non-weight bearing. But then once again, there's a little caveat to this. If the patient had an external fixator placed on that uh, foot, several surgeons, including myself, depending on um, more detail, more information such as what is the compliance of the patient, how, what is the weight of the patient, what's their support network, I will let them walk on that external fixator. So whether they're non-weight bearing or weight bearing depends a lot on the kind of a fracture it was, um, some of the social uh, makeup uh, of the patient, what kind of surgery that was rendered. Uh, so those are the factors that play a role in determining uh, whether the uh, patient or claimant should be made non-weight bearing or uh, should be allowed to bear weight after the surgery, if surgery was undertaken. And if surgery wasn't undertaken, depending on what kind of a calcaneal fracture there was, there is, there are various kinds of calcaneal fracture. And this, that's truly, that's one of my talks that I do is management of calcaneal fractures and sequela. 
There are various kinds of a calcaneal fracture. It could be a chip fracture. It could be an avulsion fracture. It could be an anterior beak fracture. So without knowing more details on the kind of the calcaneal fracture, is, it's hard for me to offer you an exact answer. So it could range anywhere from partial weight bearing to non-weight bearing. Next question. How often do you see a diagnosis of CRPS secondary to common trip and fall ankle fractures? <sighs> That's a t you know what? I, uh, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say I never see it because I do see it. I've reviewed a few cases on it. Um, it's certainly not, the, uh, I, I couldn't give you a number, uh, but it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's common and I wouldn't say it's uncommon. You're only going to look for it if you know that's something you should be checking for. Uh, uh, there's, um, in ankle sprain, one of the nerves that can be involved is the, super, is the perineal nerve. Uh, and if you have traction of the nerve, then you can end up with some nerve pathology. Uh, and then you can also end up with complex regional pain syndrome. So when I'm evaluating patients with ankle sprains, I am looking for complex regional pain syndrome so that I don't miss it. Uh, so I think that's a more accurate way of me answering that question, that you should evaluate for it. So my note uh, hopefully is saying something to that regard that I looked for, hair, skin, color change. I'm thinking I'll have the patient come back and see me in a few weeks. I won't say come and see me in three months because I don't want to miss on some of these uh, potentially very consequential diagnoses such as CRPS. Next question. Are these statistics regarding mortality after amputation true of all amputations or only after diabetes-related complications uh, where, the precursors, uh, where the precursors to um, the uh, eventual amputation? Well, the statistics that I again? sent to you are, uh, please, yes, I, I, I actually had, please, Rochelle, go ahead. Are these uh, statistics regarding mortality after amputation true to all amputations or only after diabetes-related complications with the precursors to eventual amputation? Uh, the statistics that I shared for you are only for the diabetic patient. And the reason why the, the, there's a much higher uh, complication rate, um, uh, morbidity and mortality rate uh, uh, is because of the overall metabolic process involved with diabetes. Diabetes to a great extent is known as the silent killer. Uh, and uh, that's the reason it has to be so aggressive, you have to be so aggressive in diagnosing it when any red flag goes up. And then when it's been diagnosed, it has to be very aggressively managed um, as because the consequences are so disastrous because it involves so many organs. It involves your eyes. It involves your nerves. It involves your blood supply. It involves your heart. It involves your kidneys. It involves the skin. So there's so many organ systems involved, and that's the reason it, uh, it's, uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, this is a hotly uh, pursued entity a diagnosis that comes with very associated, uh, with very high associated complication rates. What should be done to monitor for shark caught foot? Excellent question. Um, so sh I briefly mentioned uh, shark caught foot. Uh, it's spelled as C-H-A-R-C-O-T for all the other attendees in the audience who might not know what that is. Uh, shark caught foot is a, um, essentially a neurological diagnosis. Uh, so um, all patients who've been diagnosed with shark caught foot don't have diabetes. And, uh, but diabetics, because it is a um, medical diagnosis that comes with nerve dysfunction, can potentially lead to charcoarthropathy. Charcoarthropathy in the foot and the ankle, essentially what happens is your joints start to collapse. So if all of you looked at your foot, most of you probably have an arch to your foot so that you're not walking on the inside of your foot, that instep region. In a charcoal foot, because the joints collapse, rather than having a concave arch, you end up with a convex arch. So you're essentially walking on these bony prominences. So if you walk on a bony prominence, you're going to end up with an ulcer. And we've all, we shared all the, all the potentially bad things that can happen once that diabetic patient develops that ulcer, that ulcer will go to an infection. Infection will go to osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection, 
bone infection can lead to amputation. One amputation can lead to that contralateral amputation, and, that contra and then that amputation can potentially lead to death. So the key is you want to minimize uh, any, uh, minim uh, first of all, minimize the risk of uh, uh, complications such as charcoal, and if and when these complications happen, recognize them in a timely fashion and treat them aggressively. So yes, I always worry about charcoal deformity in my patients who have diabetes or who have any kind of neurological compromise, such as uh, uh, folks uh, who, have, uh, who are alcoholics or prior history of alcoholics or who have some kind of spinal cord issues or who have some kind of uh, neurological history, such as uh, the various diagnoses. So, we look for charcoal, disease, charcoal arthropathy in anybody who's got some kind of a neurological compromise because it puts the patient at, an, uh, at a disadvantage in regards to potential complications such as ulceration, uh, alteration in the way they walk, which leads to other issues. It's something we always want to look for, not only in diabetics, but also in patients who've got some form of neurological compromise. Our last question. What percentage of your work is for plaintiffs, and what percentage is for defendants? You know, I, I've never done the numbers, uh, but I'm going to say I'm pretty close. Uh, I frankly look at the, um, uh, the case, uh, and I will offer an opinion based on the case whether if I'm going to be a strong advocate for, your, for you, if I feel I'm not going to be a strong advocate, I will frankly tell you that. Uh, and... Uh, uh, if the case, uh, the merits of the case, if I feel I can, uh, um, I can magnify the merits while having a, a rational, uh, reasonable explanation of, for uh, um, uh, the weaknesses of the case, I, I give an opinion. So I really don't pick a case based on plaintiff versus defendant. I pick a case if, uh, based on if I can be a strong, uh, articulate advocate uh, uh, for the patient or for, uh, for the plaintiff or the defendant. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakra. Thank in you, folks. To being, uh, can you in addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, PASA also offers a discovery and forensic solution, free interactive webinars, day in the life videos, research reports from expert witnesses, including the Challenge History Report 2.0 and Expo Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially Dr. Nacra for her time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Nacra or if you would like to speak with a task of representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are currently working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today. Thank you all for attending.